Welcome to the uh, May 23rd Planning Commission meeting. Uh, we're going to start out by suggesting perhaps that, uh, Richard, would you lead us in the salute to the flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, under God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, I guess we could have roll call. Mr. Nader? Here. Mr. Moss? Here. Mr. Johnson? Here. Mr. Ricucci? Mr. Denio? Here. Mr. Sevison? Here. Mr. Gray? Well, we have two missing, but we still have a quorum, I guess, so we can continue to work. Uh, but we're next going to have a report from our planning director. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just a couple of updates from the board's meeting on uh, May 21st. The board started out the meeting with a commendation to Jerry Bretnell for his years of service to the Planning Commission. We will have a similar commendation at uh, the June 13th meeting. We'd wanted to have it today, but Mr. Bretnell wasn't available. So on June 13th, we'll have a commendation from your commission to Mr. Bretnell. Uh, the board took action to unanimously approve the targeted general plan update. This is the uh, policy only update that your commission previously considered and recommended to the board and that was approved. And the other action that the board took action on was an extension of the interim ordinance regarding community centers. Uh, based upon our last meeting where you provided a recommendation to the board to move forward with a, a zoning text amendment on community centers, the board unanimously approved that and uh, extended the moratorium to allow for staff to work with your commission to bring forward a proposal for the board's consideration. Uh, just a couple of updates for your June 13th agenda. As I previously mentioned, we'll be having a commendation for Mr. Brentonall. There's a proposed uh, chairlift at Sugar Bowl, a modification to the Highlands 2 subdivision, and as we have previously discussed, we will be having a workshop on possible zoning text amendments to wineries. As we discussed at our last workshop on community centers, while there are similarities between the two, uh, from at this point, staff believes it's important to consider them independently. So we'll have a workshop on the proposed amendments to the winery ordinance, and that will be at your June 13th uh, commission hearing. That's going to be held here? Yes, it will. Okay. Any questions of staff? How long did the moratorium on the community centers get extended for? The board extended it for the maximum length allowed by the state law, and that's 22 months and 15 days. Staff proposes to have a zoning text amendment back to the board by November of this year. But the way state law is written, once you implement the moratorium, you cannot Did the board give you any direction on the one pending uh, permit or request for permit? Uh, not at this time. Okay, any other questions of staff? Sure, uh, It's time to have public comment. Anyone in the audience that would care to address the Planning Commission on items that aren't going to be considered today are welcome to come forward and address the Commission with any concerns or thoughts. Oh, there she comes. Good morning, Ellie Waller, Tahoe Vista resident and member of the North Tahoe West. Uh, area plan team. 
Um, I have been participating for several months and I am looking forward to coming forward to the Planning Commission with updates in the near future. We understand that you will be hearing some of the activities. I do have some concerns that we haven't been provided with all the planning tools necessary for a layperson like myself. Um, the understanding of the difference between a conditional use permit, a mitigated negative deck, I'm learning as we go, um, and studying code um, and have asked uh, staff, Crystal Jacobson and her staff are doing a wonderful job, uh, but there's uh, some tools that we haven't been provided and also the um, consultant isn't necessarily updating um, our documentation as we go and, and again that's been brought forward to staff I think it will get corrected and I do have some concerns about the upcoming Kings Beach vision um, this planning activity for the area plans that we are working on have been uh, very labor-intensive and time-intensive for the people there's nine of us on each team there's four teams and then they're going to bring this vision in and try to overlay. So I do have some concerns that there'll be some disruption to our current planning activities. We're finding that that's happening with the Tahoe Z City vision that was put in place by the Business Association. Thank you. Thanks, Allie. Anyone else? Seeing no one else, we'll move on then to the heart of our agenda today, which is a conditional use permit for North Star Forest Flyer. And it looks like Mr. Haas is going to address this. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, the request before you at this time is for approval of a conditional use permit <coughs> for the Forest Flyer. The Flyer is a toboggan-style alpine coaster that would be located at the mid-mountain area of North Star Resort, North Star, California. Here's North Star, California. It's about midway. Um, off 267, about midway between Interstate 80 and Lake Tahoe. It's an image of the resort. The mid-mountain area is this portion down here. The coaster would generally kind of run up in this alignment uh, uphill and to the west. West, right? The east. East. Sorry, completely <laughs> backwards. It always gets me. Uh, this is the village area of North Star. This is the proposed location. Uh, the actual site would be right here. This is the mid-mountain area, as I mentioned. This is North Star Village. So the gondola would run up this way. This is where the day lodge is up there, the Big Springs Day Lodge. The coast would run uphill in this direction and then descend on the winding path coming downhill. Uh, it'd be about a 1,500-foot climb up, up the track uh, with an electric motor. The toboggans, the individual toboggans are released, and they wind down the hill on a, about a half-mile track. The, uh, this, uh, the original project was known as the Alpine Coaster and it was originally proposed down at the village to begin at the village and then ran uphill from there. In 20, uh, the, the 2010 project was withdrawn by the applicant when the previous owner, Booth Creek, completed the sale of North Star. So the project now has been relocated up the hill to address uh, concerns about noise and compatibility with the coaster uh, at its initially proposed location. So this, uh, this is a closer image of the alignment. What you can see is the development in the area there. This is the, the kind of rather straight uphill track. There are existing ski runs throughout here. This is the mid-mountain maintenance building. This is the Big Springs uh, Day Lodge. So there's a lot of activity in this mid-mountain area, and this is just uh, one more component of it here. This is an image of the mid-mountain area. Uh, that's the, if I'm not mistaken, that's the, the bottom of the village lift. Is it? Vista, my apologies. Uh, the coaster would extend uphill off in this direction. And here's an image of what the coaster is. These are, as mentioned, toboggan style. It's not a, a series of them connected. <coughs> they can accommodate one or two riders. They're pulled uphill, and then they're released to kind of descend at their own pace. They can break those if they want to to slow down. Um, you can see they're kind of designed to wind through the trees, not through a clear-cut path. Um, imagine something like the, the Ewoks of Endor, you know, moving through the trees. That's kind of what this is, is attempting to achieve. The, I'm just going to uh, briefly summarize the discussion of issues that is set forth in the staff report uh, for your benefit. The first issue is uh, 
project consistency with the zone district, the Alpine Coaster is not identified as an allowed use in the forestry zone district. So why are we here? <laughs> the, uh, this is because the zoning ordinance doesn't include a definition of a coaster at all. So we don't have any in the unincorporated part of the county. The ordinance does, however, include a section uh, that allows for the planning director's determination that if a use is not listed elsewhere in the code, it can be allowed in a given district provided the findings are made. Consistent with section 17.02.050, the planning director determined that the coaster is similar in nature to ski lifts in that both uses convey guests uphill and allow them to descend via gravity. The director's findings include consistency with the Mar uh, Martis Valley Community Plan and consistency with the purpose and intent of the forestry zone. <laughs> and these findings are included in your staff report. The second issue in the staff report that's mentioned there is the CEQA piecemeal of the project. The staff report addresses project piecemealing, concluding that independent environmental review of the project from the consideration of the North Star Mountain Master Plan <laughs> is consistent with CEQA. Findings for this conclusion are that the North Star Mountain Master, Master Plan is not a foreseeable consequence of this project. In addition, the Forest Flyer does not commit the county or the applicant to the Master Plan, and the Forest Flyer project is not a necessary precedent to the North Star Mountain Master Plan. Both projects have independent utility, uh, meaning that they stand on their own. Neither one is dependent on the other. And approval of the Forest Flyer would not foreclose an examination of alternatives or mitigation measures for the mountain master plan. The resulting mitigated neg dec negative declaration that you have there has found that there are no potentially significant environmental impacts that could result from the forest flyer project, so an EIR is not required. The next issue is noise. This was a paramount concern, as I mentioned, with the 2010 proposal, so staff was keenly aware of the uh, potential impacts. For that reason, as I mentioned, the, it was re the project was relocated uphill further away from residences. And uh, as stated in the neg deck, the noise study was prepared with data that was taken from an existing alpine coaster on two separate seasonal measurements. The noise data was then combined with ambient noise level measurements from the project site. The acoustical consultant concluded that the, the noise levels generated by the project would fall below the noise threshold established in the Mars Valley Community Plan and in the uh, Placer County General Plan. Uh, next issue is drainage. Uh, the drainage report indicates that none of the runoff from the Flyer Project site is tributary to the North Star Village drainage system. So the project would not result in new or worsened drainage conditions on the site. Uh, traffic. The traffic analysis relies on ridership counts uh, from another existing Alpine coaster in a similar resort setting. Increases to traffic site will be minimal and will be mitigated through payment into the traffic impact fee program for future infrastructure upgrades. Placer County traffic engineers reviewed the uh, application materials and um, concluded that the traffic report was not necessary for the project, that a traffic report is not necessary for this project. This determination was based on the fact that the coaster would be located at mid-mountain. This means that a potential rider would have to access the gondola uh, park in the village, access the gondola, ride it up to mid-mountain, and then uh, pay a separate fee for a single ride on the coaster. The ride would last about three minutes uphill and about five minutes downhill. So given the short duration of the entire coaster experience and the process required to access it, uh, county traffic engineers determined that ridership will primarily draw from existing North Star market. Uh, meaning the users are not likely to travel to the site exclusively for a ride on the coaster, but would visit North Star for all of its other amenities. Uh, to put, uh, Jerry, I have a question, a, a question in, in regards to that, <clears throat> because you, you talk about an increase in use. Now, with this project, they're not increasing their parking lot, so they have a certain amount of parking that they can do and they'd have to turn anybody else away, right? That's correct. So, okay, because that was my my question. I know in reading all the documentation that they're saying, well, it's going to bring a lot more people in, but if they're increasing parking, then they have a limit that sure. they can do on it. I'm happy to take any easy questions you have. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so to put the potential increase in perspective, the mountain currently has an uphill carrying capacity of 34,799 guests per hour. 
the total realized capacity of this coaster would be approximately 200 riders per hour. So the potential, uh, so the project would represent a very small fraction of all potential mountain usage, and any increase in visitation would be negligible. Uh, did want to point out that the project has been found to be consistent with the North Star Habitat Management Plan. The project site is located in, I don't really have it, forgot yeah. again to put the image. Uh, the applicant will show you the image in just a few minutes here, but essentially the Habitat Management Plan is a, is a survey of the entire North Star property, and it identifies areas that are appropriate, most appropriate for conservation, and differenti differentiates those from properties that are more appropriate for intensive ski development. This is an area identified for intensive ski development. Most of the wildlife corridors, most of the, the habitat, pri uh, uh, primary habitat, including some of the old growth forest, is off around the perimeters away from this site. So that was a brief discussion of the issues that are identified in the staff report. In addition to the staff report and the comment letters, you've each been handed an errata to the staff report. The errata provides responses to all comments that have been received since the uh, preparation of the staff report. So I think we had about 19 comment letters that were received prior. We had another uh, 9, 10, somewhere in there that came in afterwards, and the errata just provides uh, responses to those comment letters. With that, staff recommends approval of the conditional use permit subject to the recommended conditions of approval and the augmented findings that are contained in the errata. And staff also recommends adoption of the mitigated de negative declaration with the change that the hours of operation uh, are modified as detailed in the staff report and reflected in the conditions of approval. And with that, I'd be happy to any answer. Uh, I, have a, I have a few difficult questions for you. <laughs> <laughs> I had a feeling one might come Maybe up. Maybe you can go back to the photograph that shows the overall area. Okay, we have a couple of images there. It was towards the beginning. The uh, one before that one. Okay, this is the whole mountain here. Well, this is the developed part of the mountain. Okay, uh, in the staff report, there was reference to uh, east-west Martis Creek and a west-west yeah. Martis Creek. You can tell that they named these creeks in Placer County. <laughs> they always do it that way. But right. At any rate, could you point out where those drainages are? Uh, well, Aspen Grove is down here. The village is right here. The drainage runs down in this direction. Um, I'm not sure where east and west meet. My understanding is that they meet below the village. So the west fork of Martis Creek is the overflow that comes out of the reservoir? Uh, Mr. Chair? Why don't we wait until the applicant comes up and we'll have them readdress this and okay that's one question we can readdress okay. it i think we just maybe point out where aspen grove is right down uh in this area if i'm not mistaken okay so it's actually right next to uh yeah if you pull up a google image they're the ones with the purple roofs they're the what <laughs> they're the, you could in the google image they have purple roofs so it's blue, it's oh, blue. Okay. i'm sorry and apparently this is a fairly old subdivision it's that's been, been around a yeah, for a while <laughs> and then uh, let's see another question. A lot of these are just for to get an understanding of the lay of the land. Sure. Bit, but another question is um, on the noise study, it was talking about a future uh, development of multifamily homes that are within 100 feet of the coaster. Right. That would be where this maintenance building is now. Uh, okay. With the Highlands project, there was approval for a multifamily dwelling to be located in that area. Multifamily dwelling would be like an apartment? A condominium townhome okay. complex. Okay. So, uh, so if and when it's constructed, we took worst case and mm -hmm. assumed this to be the nearest sensitive receptor for the purposes of no evaluating the noise impacts. Uh, it's about 100 feet from the nearest point of the coaster. So that's where the measurements were, were drawn from. Okay. But even at that location, they didn't exceed uh, day or night um, noise thresholds. Okay. Good. That's helpful. Okay. And then, uh, let's see, a coaster. I've seen some pictures here, oh. and there's some people that are uh, kind of equating this to a, a roller coaster in a amusement park, which I'm assuming the technology for a coaster that we're talking about here is very similar to a roller coaster in terms of you get pulled up the hill and and uh, your gravity flow on down yeah and so there's I can see where those are similar but I guess I'm seeing a distinction here that maybe I didn't see in the staff report that 
In this case, we're in a, a different setting. Right. We're in a forest setting instead of an amusement park. It, right. That's at least one distinction, and I guess that's kind of where you were thinking of this. Yeah, that's basically it. This uh, it acts much like a ski lift, in that it can't be accessed except through a gondola. It's right there where all the other ski lifts are. Um, there have been some comments raised. Well, a ski lift only operates during the winter time. These ski lifts actually operate year round. They take uh, mountain bikers and hikers up the hill during the summertime. So it really does function uh, similarly to a ski lift. It, it pulls people up the mountain. They ride down in whichever fashion, in this case, on a toboggan. Uh, can, can I sort of can? ask, for, you know, a little more detail on that? This also just stays a certain amount off the ground. I mean, it, it's not like a roller coaster that most of us have in our minds. Oh, right. It has a few loops, and we right. go up two or 300 feet and drop off and everything where it goes up above the trees and stuff. It just stays a certain amount. That's a good point. You see how they're strapped in here? Yeah. They're not prepared to go upside down. They're not doing corkscrews <laughs> or, or anything or like that. Or go up and drop off right. the deal. So <laughs> in elevation of it off the ground, it looks like, is just a couple two or three feet? It, it'll vary uh, depending on the topography that it's going over. I think at its highest point when it needs to cross over roadways, it'd be about 18 at the highest point. 26. So when they have points where traffic or roadways need to go underneath it, um, you take a look and see, you can see where some of the roads, this is just very slow for me today. You can tell better on the plans. Yeah. Uh, I noticed that the same issue. Yeah, you can see where it's going to be crossing um, uh, areas that are already being accessed with, with access bit. roads and, and ski runs. I guess that access road is accessing the uh, top of the ski lift yeah. next to the top of the coaster. Uh, I'm not sure about that. That's probably okay. I guess we can get an explanation there. Let me see just uh, another final one, and then we you know we can go on. Uh, now, I guess, I, I think you've said it, but now the, the master plan that's being developed, as I think I'm reading it, is is now the, the new owners, the Vail Associates, have come in and they've looked at the existing pattern of skiing in the area, and the master plan is intended to change that so it more fits what they business want to uh, make it work. Yeah. And I think that's the way I'm interpreting it, where... There's no requirement that uh, they develop a master plan. No, no, this is something that's intended. First of all, it's been around since about 2007. So uh, it's been in the works, and it's, um, it's just taken some time to develop it. Uh, really what it envisions is the overall scale of the mountain, the usage in the future. It, uh, sorry, just bear with me while it kind of moves. <laughs> it must be the batteries here. One more. Okay, so the, the mountain master plan would um, identify areas for expansion of the ski trails and ski runs. Mm -hmm. So there'd be a new lift over here proposed at a, at a program level uh, for, the, for the mountain master plan. Also another lift over here on this mountain on Sawtooth Ridge. So going down to Saw, Sawmill Lake, uh, there'd be another lift and another lift over here. And then widening some of the ski trails. And it's really just designed to kind of prepare a vision for the future of the mountain and, um, and its development. And so this would be another level of document than that's specific uh, lift or something like that? Uh, yes. Actually, it, it would encompass uh, several lifts, I think a total of five lifts that are being proposed, ski trail widening, uh, new campsites on the mountain. Mm -hmm. So uh, <coughs> the process has been, as I mentioned, been going on for a few years here. This project is one they, they hope to construct this summer. Mm -hmm. um, so when they submitted an application, we took a look at whether or not this was in conflict or should be folded into the mountain master plan, and we made the determination that it was not. Okay, so the master plan then, if they identify a new ski lift, then that would require another conditional use permit? They, correct, right. Every new lift is going to require a conditional use permit. The mas master plan would allow for a few lifts to be constructed at a project level, and it's also going to identify program level, which is a, off into the future, uh, improvements um, that, that could come in later after the fact. Mr. Chair, a, a good... Uh, clarification for this. The master plan looks at the ultimate build-out of the resort and it looks at development outside of the existing developed area. This proposed project is within the existing proposed or the existing developed area and on that basis staff concluded 
it was appropriate for this project to go forward independent from the master plan, which may or may not uh, ultimately be approved. Wayne, you had a question? Uh, I actually have three questions. Uh, um, and Jerry, if, if this is not something you want to address and you'd rather have the applicant, just let me know, because I just need some further clarification on, uh, on uh, three items that I mentioned. One is traffic. Um, based on what I'm reading, they were talking about, again, you talked about the volume of potential riders at somewhere around 200 uh, at the peak. Um, and, but it said only five vehicles per hour. And somehow that just doesn't compute to me really well about how the 200 people fit in five cars. Okay. So uh, for, for the purposes of evaluating traffic impacts, uh, our engineers typically look at peak trips. Uh, so people will be coming and going. These are riders that typically show up in the afternoon. This is part of another experience that they have up there. And basically what it equated to was 5 p.m. peak trips from uh, people leaving uh, at that particular time. So I can see how there would be a disconnect, but really in, in deciding what the potential impacts would be, that's the figure that they arrived at. I still have trouble processing that uh, <laughs> because even if you took, you know, say 200 an hour over mm -hmm. a peak period of time, say maybe three hours or whatever, that, that's still got to be more than 15 cars. Oh, it's more cars throughout the day for sure. Right. But, but it's not... But, it's not, but the PM peak hour is where we decide or we determine cumulative impacts, where they're going to have a significant impact on the traffic system. So in addition to. Right. Right. Because yeah. uh, I was just applying <laughs> specifically that these people are coming to ride that. Mm -hmm. And if there are 200 people are specifically coming to ride that. Right. Be we did not assume cars. that as a worst case scenario, that, that okay. people would be coming there just to ride the roller coaster. Right. Uh, for the reasons that were outlined in the staff report, it's, it's our, we anticipate that the traffic that's going to be there is traffic that would already be on the mountain. Mm. This is something, as, as I mentioned, you have, to, you have to travel pretty extensively to get to on the mountain, so it's not something that um, many people would want to drive 10 or 20 miles to do an eight-minute eight, eight ride. So you're calling it an accessory use? Huh? Right. It's, it's very similar to just opening up another ski lift. Mm. Basically, that's the way we looked at it. Mr. Chair, as, as a clarification, and as Jerry stated, to determine levels of significance for traffic, the county utilizes the PM peak hour trips. These are trips that occur between the hours of 4 and 6 PM. This does not mean that other trips won't occur during other times of day. But for levels of significance, the county looks at the trips generated between 4 and 6. And it's those trips, primarily employee trips, uh, after the majority of the resort has closed, that would be generated uh, by this proposed project. Well, it didn't seem like there were that many employees involved in operating this, so I didn't, wouldn't, I wasn't really focused on that impact. I was focused on the people coming in for the actual ride. So again, I'm still trying to process that. So let's move on to my other issue: okay. um, noise. Um, obviously, noise is going to have and. Topography is going to make a big difference on how noise travels and how uh, great of an area it covers. And how did they determine, you know, again, they measured not just the operation of the equipment, but also the potential of people screaming oh. as they're coming down the hill. That's a good question. And um, how did they determine that? Because we don't have people screaming down the hill right now and equipment operating. Did they go to Colorado and try to measure something that's there? Right. Uh, in fact, the, the original proposal did not account for, um, I would call it accessory noise. It, it, it accounted for the noise of the coaster itself, and that was a common complaint we received on the original uh, proposal. This noise analysis uh, was based on, on a similar Alpine coaster, taking me measurements of the coaster while people were riding it during the summer and the winter months. And so it took a, a peak um, the, the, the greatest level, the maximum level of noise, and then an average <laughs> level of noise, and overlay that onto the existing. But again, topography is going to make a difference. I well, mean, it's going to be it, different. Right. Uh, and in this case, it was a similar alpine coaster, so it would have taken account of people riding uphill just as they are in this case, and then riding and then descending. Did they take into consideration, because they said, okay, it's not going to be any more noise than would be a typical operation of the facility. Is, is sort of the assessment I saw. It was not going to exceed the, the sound levels that are, uh, that are obviously required to, right. to maintain below that. Did they take into consideration that in the summer months, people are going to have their windows open 
so that it, and rather than when, or when the windows are closed, that that sound may carry into the structure more because of that? Well, it, what we took into account was where the nearest residences would be, the nearest right. sensitive receptors would be 100 feet away. Right. At that location, even if the windows are open, the noise would not exceed the county standards. Okay. It, it's important to note, it's not to say it would not be audible. It's not to say you right. couldn't hear it. Right. But that it would not exceed county standards. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And my last question is hours of operation. Uh, right now, they're proposing, I believe, 10 to 4 in the summer months, and, or 10 to 5, excuse me, and then they would have uh, in the winter months, I think it's more like 10 to 4. Um, is the county going to say, look, you've got to stop this at 5 o'clock, uh, and, and that's a hard line, it has to stop, or can they put those kind of requirements on? What I'm afraid of is if this becomes very popular, that there may be a motivation by uh, the facility to start stretching those hours and maybe even having lighting later in the evening and that's obviously have an even greater impact as it Absolutely. gets into evening hours with uh, people being potentially disturbed. Right, that sure would be an impact and that is something that staff considered. Uh, what, what we proposed in the staff report and also in the, in the conditions of approval is that the hours be limited to daylight hours. It's easier to enforce than an hourly uh, requirement uh, it would ensure that nighttime activities cannot occur with the roller coaster. So I think condition one limits it to daylight hours only. Well, then it could go as late as seven, potentially, sure. or maybe even eight, because daylight, you know, is obviously much longer this time right. of the year. Well, the noise ordinance would come into effect at some point, and yeah. so they couldn't generate noise past a certain hour. I think it's uh, nine, nine or ten. Well, uh, some of it would be predicated on when the main lift shut down. That's yeah, a good they point. Get, that's their only way to get home. <laughs> right. You can't yeah, get up there unless, just get it, unless it's so popular that it justifies, you know, keeping it open at a longer period of time. That's mm -hmm. that was just my concern and the potential impact of that. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? No. Thank you. We may get you back, so don't okay. count your blessings. I won't go yet. far. <laughs> I think we'll move on to the applicant, uh, Andrew, or is it whomever. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. I'm Andrew Strain, uh, representing North Star. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, address you this morning. We appreciate the staff's uh, work and input in this, uh, and would like to take you through a couple of, of the points on our behalf and try and answer your questions at the same time. Uh, as you know, we don't manufacture anything at North Star. What we do is our base economy of the Tahoe region is, is tourism and outdoor recreation. And it is our mission to provide experiences for people that come to visit us from near and from far. And they come from all over the world, as you know, to enjoy this beautiful treasure. And so we're sensitive to that uh, in proposing additional improvements. But we do continue to want to make improvements to not only the quality but to the types of attractions that are available at the resort because that sustains, obviously, our own business, but it helps sustain the community, too, and we believe that we are an important member of that community and take that responsibility very seriously uh, in, in approaching fun, basically. Um, I've heard Senator Reid say it at some of the Tahoe summits that, you know, we don't manufacture cars, we don't make wine, at least that we tell anybody that we do, and we don't solve cancer problems or transplant brains, but we do provide the recreation for those people to come that do that and enjoy themselves here. So we are constantly looking for ways that we believe we can improve the quality of the recreation experience, which helps us locally and helps our region as a brand in terms of the attraction of Lake Tahoe. One of the things that we do that I would like to take you through quickly is we survey our guests. We survey them all winter long, and in fact, we survey them in summer too. And one of the points I'd like to make sure and address is that we have existing summer operations today at North Star, and we're relatively well known for that. We have a mountain bike park. We have a great system of hiking trails. We have a wonderful village that hosts special events and has food and beverage and music and things that attract people to come there. We absolutely view this project as an addition to that and not as a standalone attraction. This will complement the things that we offer in the wintertime. It's snow-oriented. It is like a toboggan. Probably the hardest mission I have is to describe to you what is this thing. And if you will remember the days of the Alpine Slide, this is, in fact, a modern version of the Alpine Slide. There used to be one at Boreal Ridge, for example, up on Donner Summit. 
many, many ski areas have had alpine slides over the years. You leave a lot of skin in those tracks that were either concrete or reinforced fiberglass. This is a modern version of that. This uses technology to do the exact same thing, to take you up the hill on a toe and then to let you glide down through the forest. And that's what I want to make the point of is we think this is a fabulous experience for people who ski and snowboard and even those who don't. When families come to North Star, and that's really what we market ourselves as, they have the opportunity to do this together as opposed to the kids are going skiing, we're going to eat lunch, we might connect later, and we might meet for the evening. This allows families to do this activity together as a group. And what I particularly like about it, because I've, I have ridden hours that we have in Colorado, it allows you the experience of flying through the trees and introducing people to the forest. And for many people, this is the first time they've been up on the forest. They don't all uh, necessarily come all the time to that. In other settings, it's the first time they've ever been to a national forest. So we think we are going to also make connections with people as lifetime supporters and enjoyers of our forest and environments, and I think that's a good thing. We survey our guests. Uh, this is a highlight of summer surveys to measure their satisfaction with how we're doing. I think every good company does this. And to say, what could we do to get your support or to go back to your own home and tell your friends and family, you got to go up there and try this. It's fabulous. So we're always on the lookout for what we can do for our guests and what will bring them back and what will make them, as we call it, our net supporters. We're interested in that. That helps us succeed. This is the methodology. We've, we've done it for a couple of years now, and it's part of the new ownership. And we do this at all our resorts, winter and summer. You can see we do these intercept surveys of our guests. Not that unusual. You've probably seen it happen before. Uh, in 2012 summer, we actually completed 1,000 of them. What our guests told us on a scale of 1 through 5, in 2011, 52% told us it is important or extremely important to us that you offer additional events or activities at North Star. In 2012, that number went up to 61%. We want to be responsive to our guests. That's our market, and that's the market of the North Shore in general. We prompted them with ideas. What does this mean? What are activities that you would like to see here? Because it's important to establish yes or no, and then it's important to establish what is it that you want to see. In asking our guests these specific questions, Zipline, Alpine Coaster, Rock Climbing Wall, Tubing, Four Wheels, Four Wheelers, those are all outdoor-oriented activities. Those are at the top of our list of things that people said they wanted to see us add at North Star and would influence their interest in returning. We love repeat customers. It's so much less expensive and easier to keep an existing customer than it is to go out and recruit a new customer. And I think that's the same with literally every business that's out there. We love loyal customers and we want them to love us. And we think by res being responsive that we'll do that. Those things that we ask, okay, if, if you're not a net supporter of ours, what can we do to gain your support and to become a net supporter? And more activities, as you can see, are at the top of the list for us. Food options, trail maintenance, trails, price, as you can see, it starts to step down. But having more activities is absolutely one way that we can be responsive to what our guests have told us. You, had, you need to have more miscellaneous. We can even have more miscellaneous. And then you dig into the content analysis of what that is. And it's, it, oftentimes it's insightful and it's illuminating to see what it is the guest is up to. If I could ask my staff member what I'd like to be able to do for you, uh, Jen uh, Mater will pass out to you trail maps. And I do this not so you can think about, oh, you've got them, thank you. Not so you can think about renewing or buying a season pass. That's not the intent here. But what I want to do is suggest to you that we have cited this proposal in the middle of the hub of activities at the Mid-Mountain. For those of you, and I know some of you are familiar with North Star, but I don't know if all of you are, we have actually put this uh, on purpose for a couple of reasons in the middle of the mountain. This is what the scene looks like in the wintertime. You can see a half pipe uh, up there on, this, on the left-hand side of the image for snowboarding. You can see the concentration of people here. This is what the Mid-Mountain Day Lodge looks like. We're not going to win any architectural awards for it, but it is functional in terms of being the hub. And what I want to make sure and stress to you is at the middle of the mountain, which is right here on your trail map, this is the hub of activity both winter and summer at Mid-Mountain. People come up the, from the Village Gondola or from the Village Express chairlift 
We operate the gondola in the summertime. It's also a sightseeing attraction for people who've never been on a wire rope lift before. They get a, a thrill out of that. And this is, in fact, the hub of our activity. As, as I pointed out, this is what it looks like on a busy day. So part of our mission was to make sure we site this facility so it works. It's not in conflict with the existing uses. And this is a picture that Jerry showed you. The base of this facility where you actually access it and get on the sleds is right over here. It's just out of the way of the lift maze right here. One of the points I'd like to make is when this facility began the planning process back in 2009 and 2010, it was slated to start and stop down at the village, down uh, close to the residential units. And that prompted an awful lot of concern from our neighbors, and they're represented primarily through the North Star Property Owners Association, NAPOA. Today you have a letter of support in your packets from them. We have moved this facility in response to their concerns about noise and nighttime lighting. And I'll, I want to be on record now that we do not propose to light this for nighttime operations. We don't think that's the right thing to do in this situation. We do not and will not propose lighting it. But we've been responsive, and I think that's one of the successes of the local planning process is you listen to your neighbors and you listen to their concerns, figure out which ones are real, and do something about that in terms of the site planning process. That's how it's supposed to work, I believe. You've seen this picture already. There are opportunities for ski under. Question came up. There are access routes that come off the mountain. The top of the Vista lift right here, there is a skier bridge that will be about 26 feet in the air for the route to go over so that you can get off the lift and ski out to the trail. It's not in any ski trail. It's not in conflict with that. We realize we will need to fence it off properly, and you move with the snow level. Part of the height for the undercrossings is necessary for snowcats and a changing snow depth. Part of the challenge of being in the ski business is you have to manage to two different finished floor elevations. There's a winter one and there's a summer one. Your guess is as good as ours about what the winter one's going to be. It can be 10 feet, it can be 2 feet. In the summer, it's a little more predictable. So there are crossings here that will elevate the track. Part of it will be exciting and fun for the user on the toboggan. But part of it is functional, too, for the operations to be able to get back and forth. There's a cross-country ski trail that will cross underneath it near the lower part of the run. And there's a skier access at the top of the run. One point that I would like to share with you, you'll see this again at some point in the future, I hope, is several years ago our predecessors conducted a comprehensive resort-wide biological inventory and assessment. This is a fabulous piece of work and should be done at all resorts, I believe. They were able to define five different zones of biologic activity and sensitivity from A through E, A being the least suitable and E being the most suitable. The ski resort and the village are primarily in the most developed and least sensitive zone. The village is here. We're in zone A, which is the developed resort community that has residences and has the commercial village. The, almost the entire mountain today, these black lines represent ski lifts is in zone B, which is uh, intensive ski area development. We work with the conservation group and the Conservation Biology Institute in order to develop this map. This is our blueprint for future growth. How does the resort respond to the resources that are on site? Forest, who lives in the forest? What are the species that live there? Where are water features? Where are surface water? Where are rare plants? Where are wildlife issues of concern? Special interest species, goshawk. Willow flycatcher. We've mapped that out first before preparing the master plan. This is how you're supposed to do it. And I would tell you that our flyer proposal responds very well to that. As I mentioned above, the bulk of the ski resort is in zone B, which is set for intensive ski area development. As you get out to the fringes of the resort, where there are mostly forest and forest meadows, we move down into zones D and E, which are more conservation, less recreation. The flyer is sighted right at the confluence of zone A and zone B. That, from a biologic standpoint, I think you'll see a letter in your packet where there was an assessment done <coughs> by an independent third party working for Sierra Watch and MAP concluded this is the right place for it. If you're going to put it in from an environmental standpoint, this is the right place for that to be. We believe there are no physical environmental impacts associated with this and support the findings of fact and conclusions that are in the staff report and in the mitigated NAIG deck. 
One issue that I would like to point out is noise that was raised. Our clearest noise, our most, let's see if I can get this to go back. The sensitive noise receptor that was brought up was a future residential development parcel that's right here, it's outlined in red, near the base of the fly alignment. That's owned by the East West Partners who have a letter of support for this project in your packets. Today, that's our mid-mountain maintenance site. It's not a quiet place today. That's where all the snowcats, all the over-the-snow vehicles, and in the summer, all the rubber-tired vehicles go through. So that site today is developed as uh, accessory to the ski resort. In the future, at some point, it may be residential. And East-West Partners, North Star Mountain Properties, the same group, uh, has a letter of support in your packet. Lastly, my, as I said, my biggest challenge oftentimes is to be able to describe to people, what is this thing? What is a Alpine coaster? What is a forest flyer? And this, we think, will bring a great attraction and complement the additional, the, the attractions that we have there now. One thing I'd like to point out about traffic that I think is, is worth mentioning is the total ride time up and down, as Jerry mentioned, is nine minutes. People do not come to our resort for nine minutes. They come for the day. They come to ski and snowboard. That's several hours worth of time. We hope that they'll buy a ticket and they'll do this as part of that. Stay with us. But they come for hours. They come and they stay for a week at a time. Our destination guests and our homeowners, we're really a second home community in many ways. We have very few permanent residents in North Star. We also fill up in the summertime and in the winter peak periods with people who stay on site. Selfishly, we want to keep those people on site. We don't want them to get in their cars and leave. We want to provide enough of a critical mass of attractions for them to be able to eat, to drink, to have fun, to buy something in the retail stores, to take a ski lesson, to do this as a family activity that they don't want to go. We don't want them to go to our competitors. We want them to stay on property. I believe that helps the traffic situation in our region. In the summertime, people come to the mountain bike park for hours at a time, not for minutes. This is not something that will generate much, if any, standalone traffic because it's a nine-minute activity. Sure, it's new and it's exciting, and we'll see some change from that. We hope to see some uptick from that. Absolutely, we wouldn't be doing this otherwise. But it is part of a suite of activities that we offer and not intended to attract people off of Interstate 80 with big billboards that you have to come and ride this as your only thing to do. We want people that come and stay and bring their families, stay on property, and take advantage of everything we have to offer. I'd be pleased to try and answer any questions. I do want to point out that from our local organizations in North Star, you have letters of support from virtually every one of them. The North Star property owners, you have it from NCSD, you have it from, and that's the Community Services District, there's a letter in your packet. The Ritz-Carlton has provided a letter of support and East-West Partners doing business as North Star Mountain Properties. The one issue that did come up that I'll finish with is an issue raised about tree clearing. This is a very selective tree removal. 75, I think, was the total count over thousands and thousands of trees. We have actually 8,000 acres within the resort. Most of it's forested. We are, however, working with the Sugar Pine Foundation that's based in South Lake Tahoe and the North Star Mountain Properties Charitable Foundation to plant 2,200 sugar pine seedlings. Most of our forests, as you know, are overstocked and need forest treatments. We do that as a regular course of business because it's the right thing to do. We work with North Star Fire and we work with the Property Owners Association to put money and resources on the ground to maintain those forests. That's our golden goose, are the forest. There are places, though, however, where replanting does make sense. And to do that, this summer we're working with those two groups to plant 2,200 pine seedlings, sugar pines, that we think will more than offset the loss of 75 trees that are going to be cleared for this alignment. I'd be pleased to answer any questions, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry to take so long. Well, I wondered if you were going to wind down. Uh, do you have an overlay map? You probably don't have one you can show us now, but I would be interested in seeing sometime an overlay of where all the bike trails are on the mountain. And there is a summer map, and I'm sorry I didn't bring that for you. If Let me see if I can get back to it. I can point it out on the... <clears throat> And I can also ask uh, Jen to point out for you uh, where the forks of the creek are. She knows them better than I do. I always call them by the wrong name. The mountain bike park today is similar to the ski resort. It's in zone B. It starts 
starts with a ride up from the village on the gondola. You can also ride up. There's a trail that comes from the village up to Mid Mountain. Then you take your bike over and get on the Zephyr lift and ride that up. The Zephyr lift's here, and you can ride that up. There's an entire series of trails then that comes back and forth pretty much between Zephyr. You can get to the top of the mountain and Mount Pluto also between summer maintenance roads and trails that we've constructed. The trails are, for the most part, in Zone B. They do leak a little bit over here into Zone C. The fiberboard freeway is sort of the dividing line between the basin and out of basin area from Artist Valley. Snakes along the top of the resort, and we intersect with that too. Does that answer? Yeah, that's fine. I just, uh, I think it's important to know what all the activities are that are going on there so that they... They also I hub out of Mid Mountain. My colleagues aren't quite as well versed. <clears throat> yes, yeah, so here's a, you can you can actually get a look on the summer picture, mountain bike trail versus summer maintenance roads. You can see them snaking back and forth across the hillside uh, as they come back down to the mid mountain village. So that's possible to either download on the gondola or most of the time people just like to ride back to the village. There's a couple of trails that take you back down. Okay. Anyone else have questions? Of yeah, I, I had a couple. Maybe yes. just follow up. You've already uh, asked quite a few. Well, they didn't get answers. Oh, all right. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, real tough questions here, too, and I'm sure. There's, there's kind of a zigzag road that parallels, parallels the, uh, it looks like a zigzag road. That's a road? Okay. Summer maintenance road. It's a cross-country trail in part of it okay. in the and it appeared that part of this project is a realignment of that road in some place? No, in fact, what we would like to be able to do, um, Mr. Johnson, is build from the existing road that does serve the top station of that lift, mm -hmm. a spur road, to get to the top station of the flyer itself. Okay. And that's where the, you're going to use an area that is previously disturbed? It, it is, and it's a place that skiers get off the top of that lift today, the village express lift, and then ski off and get to the main body of the runs. Okay. But it is important that this will not be in a ski run. It will be adjacent to a ski run. Okay. And then, uh, yeah, we'd like to see where the drainages yeah, I, are. Yeah, maybe I could ask if Jen could come up. She can identify herself. And okay. Thank you. I'm Jen Mater. Let's see, we'll go back to the map that has the drainages. Okay, so the overflow from the reservoir is west Martis Creek. And then we have another stream corridor that uh, goes right through Mid Mountain down to the North Star Village, and that's the west fork of West Martis Creek. So project drainage from the Forest Flyer it's mostly existing sheet flow or remain that way. There's very little impervious surface. And so through sheet flow, it's conveyed into the West Fork of West Mars Creek, which uh, does run to the east side of the North Star Village and does not, is not a component of the village infrastructure, drainage infrastructure. I'm also uh, prepared to discuss oh, that too as great. in light of the drainage report. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm still a bit confused just because of the names of the west and the east and the west. The west, 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 and uh, that west, kind of west, east. And you're talking about a, a reservoir. What's? It's there. Right. So. Yeah. And what's the purpose of that reservoir? It provides domestic water for North Star, as well as uh, snowmaking water. Okay. And so it's uh, both NCSD and North Star Resort pull out of it and. Uh, the, so the Martis Creek s system through here, it, it runs into the valley <coughs> of Martis Creek, but they're, all the fingers are, were up high in the watershed. So West Fork, West Martis Creek, West Martis Creek, and then you get over here, and this is Middle Martis Creek. <laughs> so <Okay. laughs> the and so uh, you know, maybe we're going to hear more, but there's discussion. There's, there's a subdivision called Aspen Grove up there someplace. And what, I mean, uh, and I don't know if the same reservoir, there's an issue with the reservoir. And so I just, you know, maybe. Mr. Chair, that, that is a different reservoir yeah. 
that's being discussed in association with the Aspen Grove project. Okay. Uh, what's being discussed in conjunction with Aspen Grove is a retention pond, which is located below the parking lot in the village. Okay. So this is an existing on-mountain reservoir that uh, has been in existence and use for, for years. Okay, that, that ex that's good. That explains that. And so then the east fork of the West Martyrs Creek, when it runs into the west fork of the West Martyrs Creek, is that uh, below the Aspen Grove subdivision where the fork is? See it on the map, though. It's just <coughs> so these, these two forks join about right there, just above where North Star Drive crosses West Martyrs Creek at that point. Okay, where's the Aspen Grove subdivision? So Aspen Grove, here's North Star Village. They're right about there. Adjacent to the village. Adjacent, mm -hmm. adjacent to the village, north of the village. Okay. South of the village. South, sorry. South, okay. Yeah. Or north, north of the village. Well, see, north is not up on that <laughs> map. That's what's confusing. Yeah. That's the, yeah. with the confusion with ski maps. We always want to put the top of the mountain at the top of the page regardless of what compass direction it is. Right. So this, and so this would be north of the village. Yeah, the, up, the upper part of the map is the south. 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 Okay. The, the lake is to the, up there in right. the roof. Okay, well that gives me a picture of what we're talking about here, so that's, that's helpful. Uh, could we talk about hours of operation? Yes. Um, some of the letters that we got really wanted there was a number of them that asked that to limit the, uh, you from operating. Some said four o'clock. You're proposing five o'clock for the summer period now, but obviously the county's giving you quite a bit of leeway to just operate this during daylight hours. So you could again go to seven or eight o'clock potentially at night. Do you anticipate that that's going to happen? That there is a possibility that you would go beyond the five o'clock time in the summertime. In the winter time. Darkness closes in pretty early, as you know, particularly right. in, the, in the middle or the heart of the right. winter. And it gets colder, right. and we don't think we'd have much demand for that right. activity after dark in the wintertime. But in the summertime, we would like to not foreclose that option because we don't exactly know how it's going to perform. We would like that opportunity. If it is successful and people do want to ride in the early evening hours, we would like that opportunity to not uh, commit to, to not doing that right now. But in the application that says 5 o'clock. And, and then it has been changed. Uh, uh, the staff may want to elaborate on that. We had amended that in the staff report. Hmm. I guess I missed that. To what time? Sunset. Okay. So yeah. 7 or 8. But not at night. All right. We're sensitive. I'm not really too concerned about the winter months. Uh, I don't think that's going to be an issue. I'm just concerned about summer sure. and the potential impacts from operating a fairly lengthy period of time. Now, if somebody had said that uh, you may shut down things earlier in the day and that wouldn't justify continuing to operate this late, but it sounds like you're all your trails are still open at that point in the evening hours, right? You know, the bike park closes today, in right. today's operation, the bike park closes at the end of the afternoon. It has to do with the visit patterns that our customers come and, and utilize the facility in the summertime for. We may find that changing over time, and we didn't want to limit ourselves uh, without first knowing what the situation was going to be. Do you foresee that it let's say from that 5 o'clock to 7 or 8 o'clock hour, that that has a greater impact on the people in the, that are living in the area? We really don't. We don't see an impact with that. In fact, in some of the activities that happen in North Star Village, we have festivals and events that occur regularly throughout the summer, and those extend on into the early evening hours, and we think that would make a terrific complement for people who are in the village for a jazz festival or for a food and wine tasting that they could then at that point be able to access and take a ride on the flyer during their visit. You said you have no intentions of putting lighting on this. We do not. Um, I guess my question would be to staff, if they did at some point decide to put lighting on this, would they have to come to get a permit for that? They would, they would need to return a uh, request modification of this permit to add that. 
question. Would that be at a staff level? No, no, we'd be back before you for consideration. Okay. Okay. And as I mentioned, the condition stipulates that the, the ride is only accessed, only uh, able to run during daylight hours, so we didn't anticipate a need for illumination. Okay. I see one more question, and this is mainly just for information. Uh, in the wintertime when you have uh, one of these uh, big snow events, I guess do you anticipate the uh, snow ever getting above the track, and how do you we clean it? We saw that in Colorado during the big snow year where the ride would not necessarily be open for a certain period of time. There's part of us that says, boy, we hope we have that problem and that we've got lots and lots of snow because that will, that tends to bring the customers. When it's raining like heck in the Bay Area, uh, that tends to make people think, we got to go to the Sierra. The snow's fabulous. So yes, there will be times when the, the facility would not be open while we dig it out. Okay. Yes. How far off the ground is it? The average height varies between three and eight feet, and I think it's important to point out that in general it does follow the topography and the slope and uses that slope as part of its, you know, accomplishing its mission. Mm -hmm. There are places I mentioned where I think we've got five designated crossings for either skiers to get off and get out of the way or for snowcats and snowmobiles to be able to go back and forth, say, to the maintenance shop. Okay, that answers it. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Andrew, okay, thank you. If that concludes, is, does staff have any, have any more they want to say at this point? I guess not. We'll go to the public then and, and ask the public to come forward and, and tell us any comments they might have regarding this project. Oh, it must be Ellie, isn't it? Well, good, good afternoon. Good morning, still. Uh, good morning. Uh, Ellie Waller, uh, representing Friends of Tahoe Vista. Uh, I'm here today to uh, ask you to deny this request, but instead have the applicant include this recreational amenity into the forthcoming North Star Mountain Master Plan. Uh, they have built two similar forest flyers under a master plan called Peak 6. Um, the mitigated negative deck does not uh, provide enough conclusive environmental analysis and must be studied under the master plan process. The EIR will examine both project and program level components, identify feasible mitigation measures, and will evaluate the potential for the cumulative impacts. And I bring that up. Uh, this is emphasized by the proposal of the Highlands residential uh, project that's going to be just 100 feet away from this. So cumulative effects uh, must be considered. At the very least, if this negative deck is approved, I think you should add conditions to the permit uh, for the operation hours till 5 o'clock and then maybe come back and um, uh, make an adjustment to that. But to begin with, it should be stated at 5 o'clock for the summertime hours. The uh, VMT mitigation fee is at $29,000 for the five <laughs> proposed new employees. I think a traffic assessment should be a condition of permit also and adjusted for additional mitigation fees if you find that there's additional traffic. Um, you received a lot of compelling comments on the 21st and the 22nd that were in errata today, and I'm concerned with those coming in um, at the prescribed time of May 22nd with a hearing today that you didn't get to fully analyze what those uh, letters said from the uh, Regional Advisory Council member Megan Chalemi, um, a group of Aspen Grove residents authored by Greg Gatto, uh, a North Star resident, Debbie Fields, myself, I um, sent in 11 pages. I will talk about six of those items today. Um, I do want to read you an excerpt from a PR news wire dated March 6, Vail Re Resorts, Inc. Vail Resorts announced record capital for calendar 2013. Highlights for, of the calendar year capital expenditure are epic discovery. The first phase of Epic Discovery, the company's summer mountain activity plan, includes approximately $25 million to transform six of the mountains, Vail, Beaver, Creek, Breckenridge, Keystone, Heavenly, and North Star. Plans for each mountain include a zip line, rope courses, signature climbing walls, forest flyers, et cetera. My concern here is you're going to do a mitigated negative deck for one amenity. If they propose a zip line, is it going to come through? Uh, again, another case for a master plan and cumulative impacts looking at the mountain. Um, the force designation does not define the force flyer as an accessory use. Um, I'd like an explanation how you can permit a non-allowed use 
Um, that is different operations. Um, and then there is a letter from the California Department of Forestry that must be obtained for the improvement plan. I'm not sure when that comes into um, account here. Uh, the forest flyer is located in a state responsibility area subject to fire protection regulations established by the State Board of Forestry. Um, on page two of the 26 pages, I read the negative deck and responded um, to each item by page number. Um, it's called Previous Environmental Documentation, CEQA Section 15168, relating to program EIRs that indicate significant activities involved in site-specific operations. The agency would use a written checklist or similar device to document the evaluation, determine whether the environmental effects of the operation were covered in an earlier EIR. The forest flyer has not been analyzed in the Martis Valley Community Plan or the Placer County General Plan, so I don't know uh, why this should be tiered off of this previous environmental documentation. On page 7 of 26, the proposed tracks will vary in above ground height between 2 and 8 feet, as mentioned. But today, I heard 26 feet in some spots. Why wasn't that not stated in the negative deck documentation? Uh, mitigation measure on page 11 of 26, design slash site review process and or development re review committee um, may be a condition of approval. Well, what triggers either one of those? That language should have been included in the uh, negative deck also. On page 22 of 26, uh, environmental issues 1, 2, and 5 state that they're less than ex um, significant cumulative impacts of future projects within the North Star Master Plan have not been analyzed. Parking capacity has not been analyzed uh, for the mitigated negative deck because it's only of those five. But when you add the Highlands project, any future amenities, um, I think that traffic analysis uh, should at least be looked at in out years with the master plan and additional mitigation fees may need to be paid. Um, and finally, the mandatory findings of significance on page 24 of 26, section E. Does the project have the potential to degrade the quality of the environment? The negative deck says no. I say yes. The forest floor is going to be denuded in a 10 to 15 foot swath to bring this trail through. Yes, some revegetation will be put back in, but removal of vegetation does disturb the quality of the environment. Does the project have impacts that are individually limited but cumulatively considered? When viewed in connection with the effects of past projects, the effects of other current projects, and the effects of probable future projects, the uh, mitigated negative deck said no. I say yes. The development potential of the master plan is a probable project. And I will close with the frequently asked questions section of the master plan. It states, how do the proposed project improvements move North Star in the direction of more of a destination resort than a day ski area. The proposed project improvements will provide resort guests with a wider, more diverse array of terrain offerings, recreational activities, facilitating an improved extended vacation experience for the destination and day use um, guest. Is it not a recreational amenity that's being added here? It must be studied in the master plan. The applicant can't have it both ways. Thank you. Thanks, Shelley. Anyone else? Greetings. Um, I am uh, Bob Thornton. I'm the president of Aspen Grove. Um, I left my house at 6 o'clock this morning from Santa Cruz to be here. Um, we are part of the NAPOA, North Star Property Owners Association. Aspen Grove did write a letter to NAPOA requesting that, that this uh, uh, not be approved and they still went ahead without uh, letting, uh, making our voice heard, so I'm here to make that be known. We do not want this project to go forward. Um, I was gonna go over uh, several of the items that uh, my predecessor did about this epic discovery. Uh, in that, um, I have counted 20 different components that that one set of words involves, which includes off-road SUV adventures. Now, the cumulative effect of all of this, uh, I think, has to be addressed. 
Um, we also did send a, a more specific uh, letter in the comment period that um, um, addresses the legal issues that we see that are being uh, uh, neglected to look at. But um, Aspen Grove has the unfortunate distinction of being the closest downhill uh, neighbor to North Star Vale. Uh, many of you may know, uh, apparently you do, that uh, we have been involved in a litigation with North Star and Vale and the other, uh, many of the other parties are involved in the development of the uh, new village since 2008. We re recently received a decision confirming an uh, improperly installed retention pond uphill from us that was and still is uh, diverting water across our property, damaging our infrastructure, and disturbing, uh, uh, contributing to the death of many of our trees. Um, and just to address uh, the drainage, all the drainage that we're talking about here is surface uh, runoff. In the court hearings that we had in our trial, uh, the defendant uh, noted that 100% of all the moisture that infiltrates on the Mount Pluto runs through Aspen Grove. So even though it may be affecting maybe the, the diverted, whatever lands on, Asp uh, on that mountain affects Aspen Grove and our, and our, our watershed. Um, a former pristine uh, Aspen Grove within Aspen Grove, which is what we're named after, is now a swamp littered with dead aspens, uh, one of which, according to the defendant's arborist who testified in court, that it equaled the largest aspen on record. And she was also amazed at some of the additional aspens that were the, the girth of the, of the base and, and, the, and the length. And we've also been informed by our local arborist that they believe we have uh, local Indian carvings on many of these aspens. Most of them are dead, laying on the ground. Um, in the course of the process of me and uh, our association being involved uh, in this lawsuit, I've become intimately involved in the, uh, the values, the veil exudes outside of their marketing um, veil. And what I've come to understand is that I don't think they have any values other than pure greed. It is my belief that they do not care about the environment. They clearly have no respect for rules and regulations and, and or signed agreements that they make. Nor do they understand the concept of taking responsibility for their mistakes after a court has even confirmed they've made a mistake. The appearance of stewardship or concern about the environment is purely marketing, good marketing on their part. It is my opinion that uh, this application that was just filed less than 30 days ago is an excellent example of how uh, insidiously manipulative and calculating North Star Vale can be. The forest fire clearly falls under the project description of the scope of the master plan. However, in an attempt to avoid full environmental review, um, of the EPIC discovery program, including the proper analysis of all the potential accumulative impacts the entire, of the entire uh, development, North Star has submitted a piecemeal application of this minor project. So as to, by the time the master plan is being considered, they'll have most of the EPIC uh, discovery installed with no full environmental analysis with an EIR, which is required in the, uh, by CEQA. I believe it is uh, very uh, suspicious that this project has, has processed in such a very short time with only one day in between uh, comment period and this planning commission meeting. I don't know how you could review all the, the information uh, adequately. Add to that the absurdity of the traffic calculation stated. Uh, I don't see how this project should go forward. Uh, how is it that this application has even been processed? I don't, I, I don't understand. Um, and additionally, I, I'd like to make a comment about the noise issue. Um, in Aspen Grove, in the winter, if you're outside at night, you can hear the groomers on the side of the mountain. I don't really look forward to hearing screaming kids in Aspen Grove in the evenings uh, or even during the day, to be honest with you. Um, 
There are currently outstanding code violations at North Star property uh, related to the retention basin, where the court has held uh, must be removed. Uh, instead of fast-tracking additional entitlements for North Star, the county and North Star should be focusing on resolving outstanding violations, especially with uh, which are uh, uh, violations that have obvious and significant impacts to their neighbor's property. Uh, it is inconceivable that the county would approve additional discretionary entitlements to North Star when North Star continues to act in a bad faith relationship existing, uh, uh, existing in the uh, county's uh, violations. The county should suspend processing of any North Star projects until uh, all existing violations are remediated. Um, this concludes my comments, uh, and uh, I'll answer any questions. Okay, thanks, Bob. Any questions of Bob? It doesn't look like it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else care to comment? My name is Kim Storm. I live in Rockland. I am a resident of this county, but I'm also a homeowner at North Star, specifically Aspen Grove. First of all, I have made some notes. Um, I wrote all of you a letter, which I didn't have a chance caring for elderly parents to get emailed to you until two days ago, so possibly you haven't read it, but I'd be happy to briefly go over it in a minute. But before I start, I'd like to speak to all of you about the credibility of this man. Bob Thornton is the president of our Homeowners Association, and he has led our battle with North Star and East West and all the entities involved, <clears throat> along with a handful of very dedicated board members to fight the fight, to rectify the problem and save our properties at Aspen Grove from terrible damage. We not only have lost our Aspen Grove, our trees, but we have elderly owners who have the first floor and the basements of their units flooded where they've had to bring in drains and pipes. Never mind the beauty of Aspen Grove, which is part of North Star. Somebody referred, oh, is North Star, I think it was maybe Mr. Johnson said, is it an older, an older um, subdivision? Yeah, it's probably older. It's not new like that gorgeous village that was just built, but it's substantial and it's nice, and many people come and enjoy. I'm not only an owner there, but I rent on the North Star um, through property management, through their rental program. My husband and I are die-hard North Star fans. We love it. We've been there for 15 years. We'll be there till the end of our lives. But what's happened with Aspen Grove is almost a precursor to my disgust with what is happening here. Um, I just have a few very important points, and I'm sorry that gentleman just left because I would like you all to hear. First of all, in credit to North Star, it's a fabulous facility. No, they don't manufacture, but they do provide quality, quality recreation. It is a place we should all be proud of here in Placer County. As far as, um, I'll give them a little credit in their planning that they moved it from the village up to Mid Mountain. But as far as anything else is concerned, I am saying why? Why are we doing this? I question the speed of North Star's expansion with that village. I love it there. But look what's happened because of it. And look what's been just pushed over to the wayside because of this little tiny Aspen Grove community that's been affected. Such a small part 
in the money factor and the profit factor of North Star. North Star's huge. It's making big bucks. Now they want to bring this thing in to draw more people. You don't think we're going to have noise? You don't think we're going to have parking problems? Why do we need this? We don't need an amusement park at North Star. It's a ski facility for families. You want your kids to ride a roller coaster or have this fabulous experience of going through the trees? Go to Vermont. I've been on one of these. They are wonderful. But they don't belong at North Star. And in credit to Mr. Thornton, please listen to his words. I think the man has a lot to say in, in regards to what's happening up at North Star. This room should be filled with residents that are affected by what's going on up there. But people work. They have jobs. We are being assessed five and six thousand dollars a crack to fight this, this litigation. I have sat in court. I have listened to these attorneys. They are ruthless. We're talking about correcting uh, a holding pond, stopping the water, which court order they did, but diverting it. It never should have been there in the first place. Who approves it? Aren't you the planning commission? Wasn't thought given to that? I'm concerned as a resident, too. We need you. We need you to look at all this and not accept all this information this woman just provided. How can you digest that in one or two or three days? You need time. So if nothing else, put this to the side and get the facts. Now... I uh, really did not plan to speak a lot today. Rather, just be here as a show of support. But you know, the biggest thing here also to consider is that this application is uh, submitted pending the resolution of a violation of existing conditions of approval for the North Star Village. We have a superior court ruling and finding and a statement of decision in, in uh, relation to the retention pond, and they are in violation. Processing of the current application should be suspended pending resolution of the outstanding violations. Now, the reason I read that is this. We already have a problem up there, and it's a big one. And it's being ignored and pushed aside. I plead with all of you to consider the facts of the regular person, not just the big bucks. We are Placer County. I moved here from Almondin Valley and witnessed what the city's all about in Silicon Valley. And I'm still connected. My son is marrying a high-tech, wonderful woman. But I came here because I valued honesty and the value of life and the beauty of our land. And I plead with you to please look beyond the skeleton of this shady proposal. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, I guess we'll close the public comment period and come back to staff. And I guess I'm tempted to ask our council uh, <coughs> if in any way that legal war that was going on should affect what we're doing here today? No. Um, the lawsuit that's being referred to is a private third-party lawsuit. It did not include the county. Uh, the order that was issued obviously cannot bind the county because the county was not a party. Uh, the county has been aware of this lawsuit. Um, Mr. Johnson, in fact, wrote a letter to the attorneys for Aspen Grove on March 29, 2012 
when the question was first asked regarding violations of the uh, North Star conditional use permit. Um, he determined that there were no violations. Um, it, just for the, the commission's um, background, there is a provision in the zoning code that prohibits the processing of an application should there be outstanding zoning violations unless the application is to resolve those. I think that's what the residents here are referring to. Um, based on Mr. Johnson's determination that there were no violations, uh, the application was permitted to be processed. I'd also note that um, a drainage study was specifically required for this particular project. Um, the county's position is that it, we're not a party to that <coughs> lawsuit. However, from a secret perspective, um, we are bound to ensure that there are no potential impacts of this particular project. For that reason, the drainage study was, was performed. Um, a letter was obtained from the consultant who performed this drainage study on April 5th, 2013, when we asked a specific question as to whether this did impact and in any way impact the Aspen Grove subdivision. The consultant's conclusion upon which we as the lead agency are entitled to rely upon as an extra opinion stated no. There was no impact to that particular uh, subdivision. Um, therefore, it, while there is this ongoing litigation and we, we don't discount it in any means, it doesn't involve the county um, and the commission is entitled to look at this project on its own merits and review it from that perspective. Okay. Uh, I think that's a pretty good explanation. Did you have some comments on the drainage itself? DPW? Yeah, I won't get into the technical um, issues brought up in the drainage report and how it explains why they're not connected, um, unless you'd like me to. But I did want to point out that we did also ensure um, mitigation of all effects to off-site by number condition, condition number nine, which requires complete uh, retention or detention of any peak flows, um, and that would be what would affect anything downstream. So that will be mitigated through a further detailed report done during the improvement plans. And in addition, we have the support um, via letter from the Flood Control District, Placer County Flood Control District, that there would not be any downstream impacts to anything. Okay. Thank you. Are there any questions by anyone? Yeah, Thank I guess you. I kind of, you know, we heard a lot of, uh, I guess, concern about uh, cumulative impacts. And in, in one area in traffic, uh, I notice on page 69 we're talking about uh, consider the effects of past, the effects of current, and the effects of probable future projects. And of course the future is oftentimes an unknown, so you're just really you're conjecturing there. But like the discussion of traffic, uh, that it was mentioned the Highland project. I guess I'm guessing since the Highland project is apparently a proved project that was considered in the cumulative impact analysis, but in terms of the finding in the uh, MEG deck, what other uh, specific cumulative impacts were looked at in terms of making the finding we have here? For this project, staff looked at the build-out of the Martis Valley area of which North Star is a part of. And as uh, Mr. Haas pointed out in his presentation, uh, as it relates to traffic from a cumulative impact perspective. The uphill capacity right now at North Star is approximately 34,000 persons per hour. This project will have an uphill capacity of 200 persons per hour. Over the build out, not only of North Star, but of the Martis Valley area, the cumulative traffic impacts are nominal and do not raise to a level of significance as defined by the county or the state of California. Okay. Are there any other, uh, like, now we're talking about the overall master plan, which is, you know, it's coming to bloom, but it's not bloomed yet. And so were there any other specific uh, categories or that uh, of cumulative impacts were considered in relationship to that? Let me um, make one clarification with respect to uh, the analysis of cumulative impacts. When you have a project, uh, the duty to, re to analyze the cumulative impacts has to do with those impacts that are found to be potentially significant. 
Those that are found to be less than significant, there is no duty under CEQA to, to analyze them of those from a cumulative because, practically speaking, you're stating there is no impact at all. So with respect to the negative declaration and the scope of the cumulative, it would be on those um, items that are identified within the initial study as potentially significant, not those that are, are identified in no impact or uh, the less than significant. I, I just wanted to make sure that was clear. So other than the, uh, the, the, the hydrological impacts and traffic impacts, there weren't any that really popped up to uh, be potentially significant? Correct. Okay. Could uh, we ask the applicant to come back up? I do not want to talk about the retention because that retention pond is a completely separate issue, as our legal counsel has told us. So there was some talk of some maybe additional activities on the hill, uh, potentially a zip line um, that you're, I guess, something that you're going to do at some of the facilities. I don't know what you, this is something you're going to do there. Yeah, let me see if I can clarify that uh, for you, Mr. Nader. That those are aspirational statements about what we hope the future will hold. And not all of those activities were intended to apply to every resort. Those are selective. We have uh, essentially seven uh, mountain resorts, four in Colorado and three in California. And there's only so much capital. You know, there are only so many mouths to feed. And we've really concentrated the bulk of our summer activities at three. Vail Mountain in Breckenridge in Colorado and Heavenly Mountain Resort on the South Shore in Lake Tahoe. The other resorts may have one activity like is before you today, but the bulk of that planning where you saw, heard the details from the news release were intended to apply to those three resorts only. Okay. And I'm assuming that obviously if you have that ever changed in the future that you were adding more activities on the mountain, that would have to come back as for approval. Correct? That's my understanding, right. yes. Right. And, and just to clarify uh, a little bit more on this point, uh, it, the duty to analyze cumulative impacts relates to uh, current, past, and reasonably foreseeable projects. Reasonably foreseeable does not include aspirational type hopes. It's whether we have, for example, the master plan um, permit, which is, is an active permit, or, and that's generally how we define that is, is permits that have been submitted to the county are considered to be reasonable foreseeable because there's an actual tangible permit there. Um, business plans, uh, aspirations for 10 years out in a business plan are not necessarily considered to be reasonable foreseeable projects for purposes of the cumulative analysis under CEQA. Okay, uh, Andrew, maybe one other question if I could. Uh, we've, we've, we've talked about this new master plan to some degree. And I guess I'm probably the only one in this room that was here when we did the original North Star plan <laughs> back in, I think it was early 70s, late 60s. In fact, I recently saw a picture of Chester Gibbs and me meeting with Dick Englehart out in the meadow to, start to discuss it. And it wasn't a shovel full of anything happening. At any rate, so it's, it's been a long long experience and I, I guess my question of you is what types of things do you envision taking place in 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 this new master plan that's being talked about you know it, we, we don't have that up obviously before you today and I, I'll have to say I haven't heard anyone say Chester Gibbs his name for a long time <laughs> I've, I've forgotten about him until you, you mentioned him but as as Michael alluded to earlier what sorts of skiing winter activities primarily, can we do that are out beyond where we would say the existing ski area, the existing footprint of the area <clears throat> operates today? Whether or not we come forward with seasonal activities, we're going to look at those, but there's nothing specific that we've got detailed today. It's, we're, it is still purely aspirational in terms of what do we do to help become more of a year-round destination resort. What do you see the time frame for that being? Well, part of it depends on the timing of the master plan itself, and I know I don't want to get too far into that because I know it's not before you today, but uh, that process is, uh, will take its own time, and I believe we'll be back before you again uh, sometime in the process 
in terms of uh, hearings and taking comment on that, but that's uh, obviously a couple of years out in our okay. Okay. scheme of things. Thank you. Th thank you. Any other questions of the applicant? Okay, well, we've reached the pinnacle of the process. Uh, I don't think I have any more questions. I, I'm, I'm sorry that this process is somewhat being tainted by the fact that there's uh, a major disagreement going on between homeowners and, and the applicant because that makes it difficult to keep a clear view of what we're really looking at and the impacts that it is. But uh, I think they have asked us to consider that, and I don't think that that's necessarily where we should uh, plant our feet at this time. But I'm I certainly would respect anyone else's thoughts on the matter. No, I tend to agree with that. If there's no further discussion, I would um, make a motion that um, we approve the conditional use permit for the forest flyer project um, subject to the following findings and attached recommended conditions of uh, approval. A, the mitigated negative declaration and uh, um, proposed mitigation measures that and all contents and adopt it for the project based upon the following five findings in our packet and B, the conditional use permit um, and all the attachments there too. Mr. Chair, as a point of clarification, uh, these, uh, I, I believe you're referring to the augmented findings that are included in the errata that was presented this morning, starting on page 15? Yes. I think that's my phone, and I'm sorry. I'm going to say it. It sounds like mine, but it, says my, it wasn't mine. <laughs> Got my <laughs> Okay. <clears throat> right, is everyone satisfied then? That, is there a second to the motion? I'll second that. We have a second to the motion. Is there any further discussion? Um, I'd like to say two things if I could. Um, I appreciate the applicant uh, making an effort to really put this in an area that has the least impact. Um, I think that was uh, uh, a, a good gesture on your part. And I still have some concerns, uh, but I don't think they raise to the level of not uh, supporting going forward. Any other comments? All those in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So ordered. Uh, anyone choosing to appeal has 10 calendar days here at the Planning Department to file an appeal, and I believe the cost is Five hundred and twenty-nine dollars, uh, and you have. I said ten calendar days. We we thank you all for your comments and your involvement. I understand some of the anxieties that are, some of you are sharing, but I it's 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 a strange world we live in. Sometimes we we can only go so far with trying to do things that seem logical. So thank you for your comments, and and let's hope this works out in the best possible way. If there's nothing else, any, no other comments by anyone, we're uh, adjourned.